this is my first invite, so I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited to be on stage with these guys. Um, if I could pick four guys to get on the stage with, it would be these four. Now, I would probably say that if I was up here with anybody, but quite honestly, these guys, because I see them all the time, I know them, so it's a little different for me to be here with these guys. Honestly, there's a lot of knowledge here and a lot of uh, interesting stories that these guys are going to tell. And uh, they gave me a list of questions to ask these fine young men. Um, oh boy. And I don't know, honestly, they didn't give me any um, direction here as to how we're doing this. So I'm going to throw the question out and then you guys just bat it around. Sure. Um, it's how, a round table. How, yeah, exactly. However you like to do this. Circular. So, uh, let's start with what is the best defensive play you've ever made? <laughs> play. Uh, you know what? I'll go first. It's called Field Alaska Magic. Slakes missed the sack on Vince Young when he was unblocked. Okay. And Vince slides Okay, well, I, I thought I was taking the question. After AJ ate the block. I thought I was no, this is your question. favorite play. No, my favorite play. Why? Because, yeah, I did miss that play. Bob, thank you. And again, I'm, uh, it's okay. I'm the most unathletic of the bunch, right? So again, being a great coach, oh, they're like, like James, like that. They're like, I said, I was. He's pretty athletic. I was just like, hey, listen, we're gonna run field Alaska Magic. What was that? So I go run into the Garden Center, blow it up. AJ, wrap around, make a sack because obviously you can't. So that was my greatest play, right there, field Alaska. And again, we talk about it. There's roles that we all have to play. Know your freaking role. Go smash your skull into somebody else and let the players make the play. But what they don't realize, so Slags used to always complain about his role, and he was upset about it. And then when we played Texas in 05, a formation hit where the back was to AJ, so we wanted to go away from the back. So AJ actually was, quote, the sacrificial lamb. And Slags got to rap, and he was free, free as a bird. And Vince just sidestepped him. He won a Heisman Trophy, Bobby. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate, appreciate you elaborating. Would you like to jump in here? Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine being a freshman in these? No, I could not. <laughs> these guys were seniors when I was a freshman, so that's, this was my introduction to, uh, to Ohio State football. Um, for me, the best play, I think, that I remember anyway from college was a play that actually I had a mental error on. Um, so we had a double A gap pressure at Texas in 06 and the way that the blitz worked was a zero pressure and if the center went to you you were supposed to pop out Dolphin? Maka. 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 So if the center went to you you popped out center went away you go. Well the center went to Marcus Freeman and I popped out anyway. You get the pick? But the whole thing no it was the forced fumble. I sprint anyway and I outrun Marcus to the ball and so the, we're on the three yard line and the reason why I think this this story is, or this play is good, is the fact that I tell the guys all the time, we don't have enough time to be coaching effort. You can't be coaching effort at Ohio State. Like there's a standard that these guys showed me when I was a freshman of the way that you practice. And so if you practice that way, you will play that way. And so that's the way that I was kind of groomed by the way these three practice, because these guys went hard. Grooming. They went hard. They went every day in the weight room. I remember my first time doing a two-a-day with these guys. You walk down the woody before it was redone. They're working out after doing a two-a-day. Like, they train you a certain way, right? That's part of the brotherhood. And so that was ingrained in me. So, okay, you have the mental air. Who cares? The ball's still going. You run. And I remember our corner missed a tackle. You just go to hit the guy, he fumbles, Donald Washington picks it up, runs it back to the 50, ball's going the other way. It's a play that took absolutely zero talent on my end. It was just hustle. It's everything that we preach here that Coach Dave preaches. It's four to six, A to B plus two. And it was just something that because of the way that these guys displayed it each and every day, I believe that helped ingrain in me practice habits, right, that translated into game habits. So even a I remember I got a minus and a plus in the play from Fick because it was a minus because I screwed up, right? It was a mental error. I was supposed to blitz. But it's a plus because you hustle to the ball and you get a forced fumble and it goes the other way. Let me tell you about my best defensive play. Because I have a couple career tackles in my life. Okay. Really? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, we throw an interception. I'm playing for the Seahawks at the time. We throw an interception. Defensive lineman has the ball. Big dude, about 300 pounds. He's running down the sideline. I got him lined up. 
obviously I don't want to be in front of him. I want to catch him from the side and I want to hit him low, real low. Because oh, yeah. this yeah. 300, his, yeah. his legs are as big as me. I come in to hit this dude. The last thing I remember <laughs> was I was this close. The next thing I remember, I was sitting on the bench and guys was like, nice hit. I didn't even know if he hit me or I hit him. I had no idea what happened. When I went and watched film, it turned out to be I made a pretty nice hit. And sometimes that's what football is. Things happen so fast on the football field that you literally have to go watch film to find out, oh, that's what happened. So I'd say my favorite play is, and it's funny you mentioned Mockett. So we got Coach D'Antonio over here. And these are all like iterations of stuff that he got brought here to Ohio State, and he would call it. And so, if I could do a little impersonation, we'd be in the red, it was a red zone call for short yardage. And when he didn't, he was this, I don't know if you were disgusted with us or what it was, but the maca, like moccasins, right. so it was called just like, and just like point, like toss it away. Like go go make a play. And the, and the, the blitz is an all out blitz predicated on where people are at. And so like James, he's supposed to get the center turn. If they don't, if you get the center, you cop out. If you get the, the open sides, you go. On the edge, we have double edge rushers unless guys are moving and motioning out. So they give a bull call to the end if you had an edge rusher. The bull call meant you bull the tackle, there's an edge rusher outside of you. No bull meant you're contained. So we're playing Michigan State in 2005. We had lost to Penn State, we lost to Texas. We're, lo we're losing to them, they're driving on us. We're three and two at risk of going three and three. We're on like maybe the 10 yard line. Drew Stanton was in that game. He's a quarterback, fast dude. And I'm playing defensive end at this point. Dante Winter's beside me and I'm sitting down there and it's like, you know, fourth and one. And all I'm thinking is let's go get him. And then before the ball snapped, I'm like, I have no idea. Is this a bull? Is this a no bull? Like, let's, let's figure this out. And it's kind of a big deal because you either have contain or you don't. So as any defensive coach will tell you, contain is very important. So I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna bull it and I'll just kind of feel this thing out. So I'm bowling the tackle. I don't feel Dante beside me. Drew understands like, hey, there's no edge. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is getting real bad in a hurry. The quarterback's drifting. I feel no one off my outside left. And so like, Jane, you can't coach effort. And Fix said, what were you doing right there? I was like, well, I was setting him up. So I flushed him from the pocket. Drew ran and Drew was fast. He was like a four or six guy. And I just took a beeline right down the line. I'm gonna get him right before that pylon. It's fourth and one, fourth and two. And I was able to get him before he got down. And it was total panic at the same time, but then total jubilation because we get off the field and it was a fantastic play. So, and that was the infamous, infamous game where John L. Smith goes crazy where like, hey, our players are playing their ass off and the coaches are screwing it up. And that made him in third down. They made him before the half where they only had like 10 guys on the field or nine for, for the field goal. But, you know, like James said, effort trumps all. Like you play really hard, you might be able to make a play. AJ. Uh, mine was my, my freshman year, Bob. Who did we play our first game ever? Texas Tech. Texas Tech, Bob. If anyone remembers 2002, Bobby runs down, makes the first tackle of the season, basically. That's how we started his college career, made a huge tackle inside the 20, jumped up, celebrated like he did many, many times after that, and the crowd went crazy. I remember hearing how loud it was. I was running down on a kickoff at the same time, but that same game, we were beaten by a bunch. We had a really good team. The senior, everyone above us was unbelievable, but I was in a garbage time towards the end, and Cliff Kingsbury was the quarterback then, and I have a picture of this play. It was like a long scrambling around play, and Cliff was scrambling towards our sideline, and he, threw, he got rid of the ball, and I blasted him like, I took probably three steps. Now you can't I mean, you can't do anything with quarterbacks now. But I, I mean I yeah I got him right in the chin back when you could do that. And I heard the, I heard the first time I heard the same say ooh I got heard him I heard him kind of gasp and that did something to me. It was the best. It was the best feeling ever. And I have a picture of that hit and I'm fully launched like this with my forearm up like this going at Cliff's head and. Cliff's cool. I sent the picture to Cliff, like I know him a little bit, and he laughed about it and everything because it was legal back in the day. But that legit, like, that gave me a ton of confidence. It honestly did. Felt like I could play, even though I hit a defenseless guy falling out of bounds. <laughs> it made me, it made me feel good about it. Yeah, this is more in depth of, of defensive talk than I even expected from these guys. I knew this was going to be educational, but you guys are giving defensive calls, and I was supposed to have contained. It's the crazy thing about football. 
is the difference between a good play and a bad play is a guy making a play. And you will think, Bobby makes a play on this play, and even though the play is screwed up, he makes a play, everybody runs off the field, and everybody thinks that was a great play call by the de defensive coordinator. And literally, it's because Bobby screwed it up and then fixed it, and that's how it is in football. You make a play, and all of a sudden, everybody's brilliant. You screw it up, and we're all dumbasses. <laughs> Next question. Who is the best player that you played against? Ooh. AJ, you want to go first? Sure. People would ask me the best running back I played against a lot. I played against Adrian Peterson for eight or nine years in a row, twice a year. And that dude, I always said, like, when Adrian's getting tackled, he's still running. Like, his legs legit are still going. And every time he tackled him, he was pissed. And he would punch the football on the ground. And I'm like, man, what? Like, this dude expects to score every single time he touched the ball. And that's, I respected the hell out of him. So I would choose him. I went against him a bunch. Marshawn Lynch also, one of the other running backs that was fun to battle against an absolute <coughs> warrior. But those two guys were, were probably my toughest test. Were you James? James? Yeah, I, I would go with Marshawn Lynch. Um, being in the NFC West, we played uh, the Seahawks twice a year. And um, yeah, in the same way of, a, of uh, AP, that if every time you tackle Marshawn, it was going to be a fight. And he knew he was going to try to drag you along for extra yards. A lot of times he did drag me along for extra yards, but he just was physical. He had a shiftiness to him. Um, and he literally wanted to fight you every snap. Like when he stiff arms you, it was more like punch. I don't know if you felt that way, but it was like a punch to the throat every and time. And he would block his ass off. He would. <laughs> he, would. Like he, yeah. he was trying to win every, he didn't, like he wasn't, he wasn't just about when he had the ball. He was, he was trying to win. Flakes? Yeah, Peyton Manning. I mean, I, I, we were beating their ass, and then all of a sudden they got like a minute 14. You think they're out of it, and it's just pff, touchdown. It's just like, I'm, that's kind of soft. That, I, that is kind of soft. I but expected you to give us something where you had to, like, somebody was I just want physical. To win, man. I mean, no, I mean, like, honestly, I'll say this, like, physically, um, that was my game, and I, I enjoyed that. And But, like, I'm just talking about winning, right? When you When you know something's coming, and you know exactly what the guy has to do. Like, if you got him off of this spot, Right, like he was on his spot like 80% of the time. If you got it, the numbers were off, and you still get him off his spot in a critical situation. The guy's still making the play. He knows everything. You're watching tape, and again, I would say this too about about all of us here and, and what James preaches. And I actually heard Caleb Downs say it to the DB group when when Tim was talking about what what are the best players on our team do, and that's they get in the film study room. Like that's a great equalizer. Having a great football acumen is is something I don't think people talk about enough. And you can't just do it on the field. Development happens at practice and in the film room. And then you gotta be able to take the film room to the field. Right, Coach Day talks about physical reps and mental reps. Like what are you doing to your kids, right? You can get developed doing mental reps. You get developed doing physical reps, but you also get development in the, in the classroom and in in watching film. And I just always appreciated people that have a high, high football literacy, high football acumen. And I just remember when you're winning a game, you think you get on a lockdown, and all of a sudden, dude just drives down the field. There's nothing that you can do. You're jumping your spot route. He's sitting something else. And they've moved him off the spot. He's just making plays. Yeah, the soft answer, if you're going to go quarterbacks, I mean, A.J. played with him. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, you know, was that guy. You know, you, you could do everything you want to do. And then he'd pump fake, pull it down, and go run for eight yards, run out of bounds, first down, third and seven, like, let's go. Uh, on a, you know, positional player element, Everybody goes with running backs. You know, I think Adrian's great. You know, Marshawn was great. To me, it was Ricky Williams. I got a chance to play with Ricky briefly and then play against him a handful of times. And, I mean, Ricky was like tackling a stump that ran 100 miles an hour. Like, I've never seen anything like it. He could get so low, and he was so strong. And for a dude that only ate cantaloupe his second time back in the NFL, <laughs> I've never seen another human being that was like that. It was unbelievable. He was like a koala bear that like just eats bamboo and is still big and strong. Ricky would just eat like four bowls of, of cantaloupe and not lift weights and he was 235. And Zach Thomas would tell me, he's like, you should have seen him when he actually lifted weights and ate real food. He was 250 then and the same speed. So he must have been even better at that point. But it, that guy was another human. And that's why he won a Heisman Trophy and played, you know, 12 years in the NFL with caring minimally. Are you guys too young to have played Barry Sanders? Yeah, I didn't play against Barry. Young punk. Now, watch Barry. So, Barry's an elite. Barry Sanders and Michael Vick were two guys that uh, you had to see him live. 
to believe what it was they were doing. So I played offense, obviously, but I was also the punt returner. So when the defense is on the field, typically speaking, I sit down because I got to get a break. I'm trying to catch my breath. When we would play against Barry Sanders and Mike Vick, I would stand the entire game because it was like literally watching a video game, watching these two guys. You guys talk about guys that you hit that are hard to hit. Barry Sanders was so good that he would throw a move and he would affect guys that were 10 yards away. They were trying to find an angle to go get him and he would make a move. He was so incredible. Like I think about those kind of guys that when I watch them and they would shred our defense, it's kind of like you're saying, Slags, it's a guy that you know, this is where he's coming and this is what we got to do to stop him. Some guys, you can't stop them either way. Next question. Hold on, can I go ahead, back sir. on that real quick? The one guy I'd say in college, and you know, we all played, James got a chance to watch a lot of this, but he may have played him in the league. But Vince Young was a little bit like that, like in college, where you know, you like, all right, we're gonna get like one of our wideouts to like replicate Vince Young and what he can do. And I remember watching him come out, and they come out, Texas, they got the cocaine whites on, they're looking good. And like Vince Young looked like a horse of the Kentucky Derby. He's like 6'5", 240, and like all the things you watch and you see the film, and then he starts running, and he doesn't look like he's going very fast, but his stride was like five yards. He's just gobbling up real estate. And then I remember I went to tackle him, like, Ooh! And like, that's like wrap, twist, turn, pull, and try to get him to the ground. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This dude's not a real human. Like, let's just hold him up and see if we can just turn him into a pinata, and maybe he'll quit in the second half. Because if this dude can run like this, you remember they ran that, freak, that zone in the first play? And I mean, he went and got 15 yards. He outran every one of our angles. It's like, oh, this is going to be a long game. We felt really good about our game plan coming in. And then, hey, and the, the moral of the story is Muhammad Ali, like everybody's got to play until they get hit. Hopefully you can beat them up enough. But like, it was the same way, Joe. Like that dude would pull it and you'd never seen someone gobble real estate like that with size. You would hit them and it, or not like Schlegs, you would try to hit them and you couldn't get them down. Buckeyes. What was the what was the number two school for you guys? If it wasn't Ohio State, where would it have been? Uh, for myself, I um, probably the only other real Big Ten offer I had was Penn State at the time. Uh, I was just waiting to get an offer from Ohio State basically the whole time. But I was probably I was close to going uh, to Miami of Ohio because my brother was there. But then my brother transferred to OU, so it really screwed me. So I guess you it's good me I did. You love the Penn State like locker room scene. Well, when I, I didn't really get to see too much of that, Bob. Um, I didn't really get in, I didn't really get to get the tour of the state. I wasn't a big enough star. I was a two star, three star. I think they didn't give me that full treatment like you got. But I think, uh, yeah, probably, yeah, probably Miami, maybe OU. <laughs> <laughs> what? what? I got, I got, uh, besides Penn State, Bob, they treated you well. Besides them, where would you have gone? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was all in. My dad wouldn't let me go there though. He said there was some, some stuff going on. He didn't, had a weird vibe, weird vibe, with all of that. Um, number two for me, it was. It, I don't know, my dad made me fill out this chart of like 15 questions, rank the schools on different things. Ohio State was number one. I didn't know it, he pulled it away. He said, where do you wanna go, Ohio State? I think the number two team is probably North Carolina. I mean, if you're from Ohio, like you go down there, Petey Pablo just come out, like I go on my visit, it's 90 degrees. They got like Julius Peppers playing DN, who AJ played with, who's not a real human. He's like someone you make in a lab. Um, they had Ronald Curry was their quarterback. I think they were 10 and two. And it's 90 degrees December 1st. And there's a, there's a lot of really good looking girls down there. It was, it was a really a great experience. And I'm like, I, it was my first visit too, by the way. First time I'd ever had lobster in my life. And I'm like, I'm ready to go. My dad's like, they'll all be good. Like, let's take number two before we commit on number one. Fanuts is down there and like, I was all in. I mean, it's, it's the first place I'd ever been. There was, it seemed amazing. And then, like, growing up in our era, like, North Carolina, especially, you play a little basketball, Michael Jordan, they got the Carolina Blue. It looked sweet. And uh, then I came here and met some of these guys, and maybe not those two, but this guy on the far end. And then they we indoctrinated them later. Schlegs, yeah, what was your number two? I, South I, Carolina. I went we had to the, convince him. I went to the Air, I mean, I went to the Air Force Academy, right? So I transferred before a portal. And I would just say this, like, I came to Ohio State because of the brother. I came because of these guys. I came to come 
He calls him Mark Antonio. So I call him Mark Antonio. Our visit is legendary, okay? That's on a different stage. You can catch that on Morning Juice tonight, someone with a fan, and Bob. Uh, a little plug for you, Bob. Um, but really, I mean, Mark, it's a total God thing. Mark D'Antonio was coached by my D coordinator at the Air Force Academy and Richard Bell. There was a lot of Ohio ties. And and obviously, meeting Coach Dino and then Tress and what they were about and what these two were about. I'm like, these dudes are just like me. They're just like the brotherhood that was in Ohio State. I'm like, let's go. I mean, honestly, I'm from Texas. I mean, look at our weather. It's terrible, but you got big deer and you play great defense. Sign me up. Good news, like we go out with Schlegs and AJ's host him. I'm there, we're kind of tag teaming it. And you know, we go to an adult establishment. So we're, he's 21, we're not quite to that age yet. And so like, hey, you feel guys out, you know, you want to have a drink? So yeah, I want to have a drink. So there's a guy there that brought over a couple of pitchers. Uh, they were going to pour a cup out, you know, get cups. Schlegs just slid his hand in the side of the one pitcher and AJ and I got to share the other one, so. Who's the Air Force guy? It happens. James, what do you got? My, my only other offer was Minnesota, so I would have been a uh, golden gopher head and not come here. And quite honestly, I uh, to me when I when I came here on my visit, I think it was this. It was like the who's your host? Chad Hoogler. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and so it was the standard of excellence watching practice. It was the way they practiced, how competitive it was. And then seeing these guys operate, that it was like, if your dreams really were to be the best at what you did, why wouldn't you surround yourself with others that are already further along on that path? And so for me, I watched them operate, and then I was like, that, that's where I need to go. And obviously Coach Trestle was a big part of that, Luke Fickle was a big part of that. But I think it was craving, I could see a vision of what it was to be like, like a real dude at linebacker, you know what I mean? Like, by the way they worked. And AJ had just been an All-American that season, I came to bowl practice and just seeing the way that they did it was like, okay, well, if you want to become that, then why don't you go try to replicate their work habits? So we had Miami of Ohio, Minnesota. I don't know what the hell you said, Slags. I mean, I, I mean I we were his second. He was talking yeah. about drinking beer and I didn't Big say that. And stuff. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, North Carolina? That's that that is, that's interesting. I thought we were going to get. That's it. I'm glad you guys came. Thank you, Joey. Welcome. Appreciate your us. So now, <laughs> let's get into a little bit of the coaching aspect of this. Um, if you're speaking to a young coach that is just starting out, now the question is pointed toward linebacker, but I don't know that it has to stay there because coaching is coaching. You got to know what you're talking about whatever position it is, you're coaching young kids today and you're just starting out, what advice would you guys give? James James is an official coach. Yeah, why don't you so lead off? off. Start off, James. Tip of the spear, James. Yeah, tip of the spear. Um, well, I think, I think as a coach, when you're coaching young people, is that you have to be extremely detailed, and you have to be extremely organized. And what I struggled with my first year when I went up to Notre Dame was you have this wealth of knowledge from playing, how are you going to communicate it when you're, you're trying to teach at a level, at like a 500 level of, of learning to where you haven't taught the 100 level yet, right? Yep. So you have to teach, what's your progression? What's your style of teaching? Because coaching is teaching. That's all it is. You're trying to teach them how to play the game. And so you have to figure that out on your own. And if you're disorganized or you're not prepared, then you're going to be pretty poor at it. And so I just remember my first spring being overwhelmed with, you have so much to cover. Okay, where do you start? Where's, where's the baseline on where you start? And I think as a young coach, it's not only figuring out like what's your routine and how do you prepare to present the material, but you also have to realize how do I connect with my players? Because what I've learned is, and I've felt as players, I don't know you guys can tell me if I'm different, is that the coaches that you played hardest for is that you felt that they cared about you. You felt that they wanted what was best for you, right? So Luke Fickle was hard on every one of us. Luke Fickle had a standard for every one of us. But I also knew that Luke would call you in the office and really check on you, make sure you're okay. You knew where Luke was coming from. You knew that he was gonna be the same with everybody. And so I felt like he could, he could say whatever he wanted to me. I run through a wall for him because I felt like he had my back because he was pushing me to be someone that I wanted uh, better than what I could be. 
And I think as a coach now, you try to figure out how do I coach each individual to a similar standard, but you can't coach them all the same. They're all different. Every one of your players is different. But if you don't invest time in them, and you don't have that relationship with them, none of it will matter. Because there are some kids who will just tune you out if you don't have that relationship. And there are some that, like Schlegs, I could, Schlegs, when he played, that like, you could yell at Schlegs all you want. And then we had some other teammates that we all played with that if you treat them the exact same way, they just tune you out. You know what I mean? So you have to figure out how do you connect and get them to not only play harder for you, but also we all learn differently, right? There are some guys who can learn. You can tell them one thing, they're out in the field. It's, it's good by walkthrough. And there are some kids where you have to physically go out and walk through the mistake or walk through how it's supposed to feel for them to understand it. And you can't use... There's no excuse for not having them both try to at least perform at that same standard, if that makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think what James was you know, alluding to is there's a lot of stuff that Coach Tressel talked about, you know, Coach Antonio who was up here, and it's something they always echo, like they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that connectivity that you have with your players and finding out what it was. The, the amount of times a guy sitting over there, I mean, I dog cussed him under my breath. Like, I absolutely hated it, but he was very demanding, but he, was, he cared about you. And you knew that deep down. It was the same thing with Luke Fickle. Like, he cared about you. He knew that deep down. And so finding that connection, how do they learn? How do they talk to you? You know, finding a way to connect, have some common ground. And the best people that are the best connectors, like, they find that common ground, that relational aspect. And then they begin to teach to it of what you're able to do. And then you can teach technique, and you can teach steps, and you can teach route progression, and you can, whatever it might be. But it comes down like to the connection and investing. If someone feels like you are investing in them and they care about you, like most guys, they'll, they'll, run, for, they'll run through a wall for you. Like the best coaches I ever have, I, I had, I hated every day. Hated every day. D'Antonio, Fick included. Jim Schwartz was up here. Like those guys, they were demanding. But on the same side of that, after practice, they pull you aside. Hey, here's what you're doing here. Here's what you're doing there. And this is what you need to do to get better. And so when you do that, like, they'll be able to connect. Schlegs is one of the best at it. So is James, but connect. Yeah, I, well, thank you. Gas station ready, everybody. You know, I, um, I'll say this, and they're spot on. I would take this, uh, young coach. Are you fanatical about serving people? I mean, honestly, like, if you're a coach, you're a servant. That's what you are. Or are you a comp tickets and sweats coach? That's a yeah. self-introspection deal, right? Are you just a bystander or are you fanatical? Are you fanatical about your craft to then serve the player regardless of where they are, right? If you're coaching high school, think about the impact that you could have, not just on the guy playing, because we, like Coach Antonio said, we are judged by our wins, but you guys are judged by how you develop young men. And in order to develop young men, you gotta be fanatical at service to young people. That's it. Every day you wake up, how can I be 1% one one better for that player? And that's the relationship that they said, but it's also opening your eyes. Kids, and again, I'm very blessed. I got older kids than them, so I've seen this. But think about how you coach your own kids. They're not all the same, to James's point. But if you want to take them one step closer to their mass, mass capacity, it's not going to be one size fits all. You're going to be in the weeds of that. I tell you what, man, learning, learning and understanding kids, they're not defiant because they want to be defiant. They get defiant because they don't know. And that's your job as an educator and as a servant to make sure that they know. And so if, I remember one of the things where we lost to, we lost to, uh, what did we lose, the Orange Bowl, and every coach had to change rooms because you're an educator first. How are you communicating that to your players in the weight room? certain cues that we use to do a squat or a clean or whatever the case may be, I don't care, right? That, that, might, that might not resonate, but what, what could you say that will resonate? And if you're in a weight room, do you train? Because you need to feel it. So I think that to me, one, being fanatical to be a servant and understanding why you're there and you're there to educate, to their point. Yeah, I, Schlegs and, and James both, like I, we knew James was gonna coach when when we were here, like you could just tell James was so detail oriented, like how he understood the game and Schlegs, you could bring him to any event on the planet and Schlegs will make that event better and bring more positive energy to that than you'll ever have. So that's, that's honestly who they are. But I don't have any like big philosophy things. I, I know what changed 
change for me. Uh, I think going into my junior year, Luke Fickle, linebacker coach, he started to get on me and tell me to use my hands more. And it sounds super basic and everything. The, the low boy sled out there, and you step and just keep your elbows in, boom, and just learn to just fire your hands. And it, that's like, if you're like intentional about it, like, the difference. The difference. It's over here. You guys see the difference that Schlegs sells. That, I didn't have it back then, unfortunately. But just using the hands, like, I, I've been an assistant coach with Bobby and our, our kids' teams. Like, I always tell them, you don't ever, don't ever let anyone put their hands on you. On the football field, off the field, obviously, as well, Bob. But what I'm saying, right. if you can just put your hand on your shoulder, I'll do that to kids. Yeah, there you go. Like, so I do that with all my kids. James, put your hand, just put your hand on your shoulder, James. Just boom, no matter what. Like, just chop them down. Just get in that habit. I do that with the kids that just touch their shoulder pads. If they don't chop me down right away, guess what? Two weeks later, they're all like, they can be talking to a kid right here, and all of a sudden they feel me coming, and they'll swipe me before they're, they're there. So it sounds like basic and stupid, but it's ripped. like for me, it, it changed everything about it when I was super intentional with my hands. And I'm just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw my hands through this dude's chest. Like, and, no matter, and even sometimes you do that, sometimes you get a little faint and chop their arms, like you, everything comes with it. But if you don't use your hands, you're completely screwed. If you use your hands, you're going to always have a chance, no matter how big the dude is. 6'6", six, six, there's these 6'6", six, six, six foot six offensive tackles in the league that will, like, we disappear. I remember a couple of times I disappeared on film. These dudes are so big and they come out and get me. You can't let them get to you. So before they can get me, I'm chopping. I'm doing whatever I can to get away from them. And that changed for me. Like, and I, I would think about that all the time. Going out to camp, you know, you hear the old cliche thing. Trying to get better at, like, one thing every day. And it's, it sounds great, but like, it actually is it's pretty good. It actually works. <laughs> and I remember I always thought every day, I would think of certain things, but no matter what, I always thought about using my hands. And that's all I ever, I still do it, still. Yeah. So now I coach Shop my kids. young kids now, because- yeah, Mikey I, and Jed. Yes, I coach all my kids. Let me give you just one small piece of advice, and it's, it's crazy how it disarms kids, and it's sort of to the connection thing that you're talking about. Ask your kid or kids a non- football question about their day when you see them ask them how school was ask them how their brother is ask them what did they learn in school and it is crazy how connected you become with your kids when you do that and then the next piece that comes from that once they know I care about their day I can now get them to run through a wall because now I care about you. Not just what you can do for our football team, not can you make a tackle, I actually care about you. So I'll start off with my young kids. Tell me something you learned in school today. <coughs> if somebody can't say something, they all gotta get down and give me five push-ups. And it literally becomes a friendship between us and now we can do what Slagle's talking about, like that Rrr. Slagle looks like he wants to tackle somebody yes. right now. I, I'm always, I, I, I would, you know, I'll also add this too, like, be authentically you. Yes. You know, like, like kids at this age that you're coaching, man, they, they see fake. Yes, because it's all over social media. They see fake, man. You have to be you. You can't replicate. James has to be James when he's coaching. Right? Be authentically you. And guess what? You are the tone setter. You're the juice giver. Our guys come in every morning at 715. And now we just, they just had a 20 period practice and we're in the weight room. I kid you not, this happened this morning, man. Mix in there, kickstart your heart comes on and it's, and it's just on, right? And he just, he literally cranked it up to where it's kind of deafening. And I have a kid that's a little bit of a low juice guy, but through the group, right? I saw my dude freaking bobbing his head a little bit, man. And like, he started giving and there's some days I'll go like this. I'm like, boom, take, take a little bit of mine. But that's what you gotta do. Yeah, just whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Sometimes you have to do this. Yes. Sometimes you have to do we're, we're getting the hook, fellas. I appreciate everything. I appreciate the intensity. I think you can tell how much these guys love the they game. They promised football. us at least 45 minutes. No, no, no. Right. This thing was supposed to start like an hour before it started. So blame Coach Hinton for getting us started up here later in the evening. Thank you. Give him a big round of applause. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Coach.